So today's webinar is about vaping among youth as part of CADCA's research into action series. My name is Maria Julian, and I'll be your moderator today, along with Carolina Duth with CADCA. This webinar is co-hosted by CADCA and Counter Tools. Our mission at Counter Tools is to empower communities to become healthier places, starting with the retail environment. We provide consulting, in-person and web-based training, storytelling materials like infographics, and a suite of tech tools that help track what's happening directly in communities. We also support efforts across the, the country as they relate to advocacy and research. You can visit countertools.org for more information. So for those of you who are new to Zoom webinars, you are muted right now by default. And you can send general messages and comments, questions that you have using the chat feature. That's what we'll be using today. We hope that you will ask questions during the presentation. The webinar today is being recorded and the recording will be available on the CADCA website and the slides will be emailed out to all the participants. So thank you all for being a part of the webinar today. I hope you take away some useful information on how to address e-cigarette use among youth. And now I'd like to introduce Carolina Duth, Senior Associate of Evaluation and Research for CADCA. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to this Research into Action webinar. Um, I, as Maria mentioned, I'm a member of the Evaluation and Research team here at CADCA. And the Evaluation and Research team does three main things. One is to evaluate CADCA's trainings and events. Another is to help coalitions evaluate their work that they're doing in their communities. And uh, the third thing is to help coalitions access the latest research and evidence-based strategies. Uh, to support their prevention work. Um, so supporting that, um, that third point, we offered this particular webinar series. If you haven't participated previously in one of our research and action webinars, the purpose of this webinar series is to introduce coalition members and substance misuse preventionists to current and relevant research being conducted in the substance use and community coalition fields. We're excited to be partnering with Geographic Health Equity Alliance and Counter Tools for this installment in the webinar series on vaping among youth. I'm joined for this installment by Dr. Jessica Barrington Tremis. She will be presenting on her and her colleagues' articles, Tobacco Retail Licensing and Youth Product Use, which discusses the impact of strong local tobacco retail licensing policy on tobacco product use, including e-cigarettes. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jessica barrington Trimis. Uh, Dr. barrington Trimis is an epidemiologist and assistant professor of preventative medicine at the University of Southern California. She directs the USC Epidemiology of Substance Use Research Group and is a faculty member in the USC Health, Emotion, and Addiction Laboratory, the USC Institute for Addiction Science, the USC Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science, the USC Institute for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Research, and the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Barrington Trimis' research focuses on investigation of the rapidly changing tobacco, alternative tobacco, and cannabis landscape. Her work aims to identify intra-individual psychological, behavioral, and social processes associated with nicotine and cannabis product use in adolescence and early adulthood and to elucidate the behavioral consequences for example transition to more harmful patterns of substance use and physiological consequences for example adverse respiratory health effects of e-cigarette use of varying patterns of cannabis and nicotine product use in adolescence and now i'll turn it over to dr barrington tremis to discuss her research hi everybody thank you um, so much for joining this webinar. Um, so I am, I'm going to start by just kind of giving an overview of the scope of e-cigarette use um, and cigarette use among youth and, and then lead into some of the, the more recent work that we've been doing with respect to the tobacco retail environment. Um, so hopefully, oh good, it looks like slides are progressing. Um, so as many of you may be aware, e-cigarette use over the past 
seven or eight years has really skyrocketed. Uh, back in 2011, uh, the, the proportion of high school students that reported past 30 day use of e-cigarettes uh, hovered around 1.5%. Uh, this increased between 2011 and 2018 with a huge jump seen between 2017 and 2018. Uh, where an increase of 78% was observed in the, the proportion of kids who were using e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. At the same time, the prevalence of cigarette use has continued to decline, although you'll notice that over the last five years or so, uh, there's been a flattening out hovering around 8 or 9% of past 30-day use of cigarettes. The, E-cigarette uh, product itself has really evolved over time. Um, and it, it's worth sort of talking about the different products um, because the, the health risks that are posed by these different products really differ um, from product to product. So back in 2011, uh, 2007, uh, the first e-cigarettes that really made their way onto the market were these products that we refer to as Sigalikes. Uh, the first product on the left, you can see looks like a cigarette. Um, it was intended really to be a substitution for people who were currently using combustible cigarettes. Uh, the idea being just switch over to this product. It's exactly the same. It looks the same. It feels the same. And, um, it, you know, and it's, it's better for you. Um, but very quickly, these products that look just like cigarettes evolved. Um, the product right next to it is a blue e-cigarette, the all black one. It looked, uh, looked and functioned very similar to the original e-cigarettes, but had a uh, coloring that differentiated it from, from a cigarette. Um, from there, in 2009, we really saw a, a huge increase in, in the prevalence of, of use of these products called, uh, which, which we refer to as vape pets. Um, so these products were a huge step up from the sick likes. They were better at nicotine delivery. Uh, they were more customizable, so you could select your own e-liquid separately, put it into the, the vape pen, and, you know, and switch flavors throughout the day. Um, and these things were rechargeable. They weren't something that you threw away, like the early sick likes. Uh, from there, there was a progression to mods and box mods. Uh, these products were even more modifiable than the vape pens are. Um, with the mods or box mods, users can select the battery that they want, so if they want a stronger, more powerful device, they can use a, a more powerful uh, battery, they can change the voltage, they can change the temperature of the device itself, um, they can, they can uh, add a new atomizer, which, which impacts how um, the vapor how the e-liquid is, is transformed into the, the, uh, the aerosol. Um, and there, there just was a lot more that could be modified with these products. Um, as I'm sure everybody is aware of, Juul really made its entry into, uh, into the market in around 2015 and since then took up, just took off in popularity. Um, there, along with Juul and shortly after Juul came onto the market, there's been a lot of other products that look like Juul, uh, products that are almost in, indistinguishable from Juul in the shape and color um, and in the level of nicotine that is given off. Um, from there, there's been an evolution to other types of uh, what are referred to in the research community as pod mods or pod vapes. Um, which similarly uh, use sort of a more advanced nicotine formulation, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then most recently, uh, we have these squonk mods, um, which are, are another type of, of device that allows the user really to get a very high level of nicotine. Um, so one of the things that is, is particularly concerning about these most recent e-cigarette products is that the nicotine level for these is substantially higher than it was back in the early e-cigarette products. So uh, with Juul, um, Juul is the first device that, that really came out with, um, with a salted nicotine formulation. And what the salted nicotine formulation did is allow Juul to include very high levels of nicotine without having an aversive uh, effect on the user. So with the um, free base nicotine solutions, the, the nicotine uh, solutions that were used in the early devices, um, the higher, like at, at a, a high level of nicotine, there, there comes a point when 
um, when the nicotine level is just too high that it's completely aversive to the user and the user just can't even inhale it. With Juul, using the salted nicotine formulation, the level of nicotine can be much, much higher without having that aversive effect. Uh, when we're talking about kids, this is particularly uh, problematic because, um, as I'm sure many of you have heard in the news over the last uh, several years, that there has been a lot of anecdotal evidence that, that kids are really getting addicted to Juul. And part of the reason for that is because the, the nicotine level in Juul is so, so high. Um, the other Pod Mod products uh, that are on the market, there are some that can be used with the traditional free-based nicotine, but others that also use that same salted nicotine formulation, which allows for very high levels of nicotine. Um, just to give like a, a very quick comparison of the nicotine levels, uh, in Juul, you're looking at um, probably around 50 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine. Um, while in the mods and box mods, more common levels are about three or six milligrams per milliliter. Um, so you can see if you're comparing three or six milligrams per milliliter to 50 milligrams per milliliter, there's a huge, huge increase in the level of nicotine in these newer products. So um, today I'm going to talk through a, a few different question, research questions that are important to, the, to this overall discussion of what can we do about e-cigarettes and youth. Um, so first I'll go through some data on uh, to answer the question whether e-cigarettes are drawing in new low-risk youth, uh, whether youth who begin using e-cigarettes are more likely to subsequently try combustible cigarettes, whether youth are just experimenting with smoking or whether they go on to smoke more regularly, um, and, and these first three sort of by way of background. Uh, and then I'll present some new data on, that we have on where youth are actually getting their e-cigarettes and data on the impact of strong tobacco control policy, which I think is where, uh, where everybody attending today can really, uh, really begin to make, make an impact. Okay, so first, are e-cigarettes drawing in new low risk youth? Uh, the short answer to that question is yes. Um, we, in, in this study here, looked at the trends in tobacco use over time. Um, so shown here in black, you can see this is the prevalence of past 30-day cigarette use among 12th grade students. Um, from 1995 to 2004, there was a pretty steep decline in the prevalence of past 30-day use, which really sort of leveled off between 2004 and 2014. Um, and this is here in Southern California, where, um, where the rates of cigarette smoking are, um, are, are generally lower than they are in, in other parts of the country. Uh, when e-cigarettes came onto the market, uh, we really wanted to know whether the e-cigarette users in 2014 were um, essentially part of that would-be cigarette smoker group. So whether we just sort of saw a redistribution of, of this sort of cigarette smoking group so that there are now, um, instead of being all smokers, it's now half smokers and half vapors or something like that. Um, but instead, what we saw is that the prevalence of, ooh, hold on, I'm having some problems. There we go. <laughs> um, that the total prevalence of cigarette or e-cigarette use was actually substantially higher in 2014 than it was in 2004 and about the same as it was in 2001. Um, so if you look here, you can see that really the e-cigarette the e use is just adding to the total prevalence of tobacco use overall. Um, there was about a six raw percent increase above what we would have expected if there was just complete substitution, um, which represented a 75% increase in overall tobacco use above and beyond what we would have expected to see had e-cigarettes not been on the market at all. Um, there was a similar finding that was done nationally in the US. Uh, this is a paper by Dr. Dutra and Dr. Glantz uh, that used data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which is a US national study. Um, they found that in 2014, um, that gray bar is, is your e-cigarette only users, uh, that that was above what they would have expected, which, is, uh, which was uh, predicted by the blue line. So we know that vaping is drawing in at least some lower risk youth who likely wouldn't have smoked. Um, but the next question is then what happens to these kids? Do they just 
take a puff of an e-cigarette and that's it? Or do they go on to other behaviors that may be more problematic? So do youth who begin using e-cigarettes then subsequently begin to use combustible cigarettes? Um, there have been a number of studies that have come out and looked at this association. Uh, in this graph here, you can see that the red uh, bars here are the proportion who, the proportion of ever e-cigarette users who subsequently began smoking cigarettes. Um, so these, all of these studies were restricted to never cigarette smokers at baseline. Um, so the red group all represents people whose first product, youth whose first product was an e-cigarette. Um, you can see that they, the rate of smoking initiation among e-cigarette users is substantially higher than the rate of cigarette smoking initiation among never e-cigarette users, which are shown in black. Um, so there's a huge difference here. All of these were statistically significant in terms of the effect estimates. Um, and overall, we found that across all of these studies, um, youth who had used e-cigarettes had about 3.5 times the odds of subsequently beginning to smoke combustible cigarettes. Um, so this, this uh, meta-analysis of these Seven studies was published in 2017, um, and the, the seven studies included here are, are national studies, are some studies that are specific to Hawaii or Southern California, um, but really the finding is, is very consistent across the board. Um, since this paper was published back in 2017, there have been a lot of additional studies that have found similar results. Uh, this is just a smattering of different studies that have come out um, over the last year or year and a half or so uh, since that paper originally came out. They've all found exactly the same thing, that youth who use e-cigarettes are substantially more likely to then subsequently begin using combustible cigarettes. Um, these studies have been found not only in the United States, but in Canada, in Mexico, in Germany, in Scotland, in England. Um, all over the place. Um, so related question when looking at this association though is, is whether the risk of transitioning from e-cigarettes to cigarettes is happening among kids who were already at high risk for smoking anyway um, or whether it's happening among kids who are at low risk for beginning to smoke. Um, one hypothesis is that well you know, among those who are using e-cigarettes, if the kids that then start smoking are the kids who would have smoked anyway, then there's really not a huge impact to public health. Um, but if there's a higher risk of transition from e-cigarettes to cigarettes among low-risk adolescents, that's a lot more concerning. So there's been a series of papers that have looked at these associations and whether the association of e-cigarette use and subsequent cigarette smoking differs by for low versus high risk adolescents. When I talk about low risk adolescents, each of these studies has kind of defined that in a different way. Um, but in particular, um, you know, we've uh, studies have, have defined low risk adolescents as those not susceptible to smoking, no friends who smoke, they perceive smoking as bad, there's high parental support, they're not rebellious, they've not used other tobacco products, and they have a low psychological risk profile. Um, so these are all of the kids that we would not expect to begin smoking cigarettes. Um, what the studies have largely shown is that the risk for transition from e cigarettes to cigarettes is higher for the low risk adolescents. So among the low risk adolescents, you can see that the effect estimates or the odds of subsequently beginning to smoke combustible cigarettes if kids use e-cigarettes is much higher for the low risk youth. So another way to think about this is that among low risk youth, vaping is, is acting far more as a risk factor for smoking than it is among high-risk youth who likely would have smoked anyway, regardless of whether they vape. So vaping is bringing in new kids to the, this realm of tobacco product use, and the low-risk new kids that, that enter are actually at the highest risk of them progressing to, um, to combustible cigarette use. Okay. So 
I guess an, another important follow-up question then is, well, do kids just smoke one cigarette and then that's it, they're done, or do they go on to smoke more regularly? Um, so this is from a paper that was published last year in pediatrics that we did, um, where we really wanted to understand whether the patterns of cigarette smoking differed for people who first, for, for our youth who first used e-cigarettes and then progressed to smoking or for kids who, um, who just went straight to smoking. So among the never e-cigarette users, this is the top graph here. Um, you can see that the risk of smoking initiation, which is 7% in this group, um, is lower, it's the black slice of the pie here, is lower than among e-cigarette users, which is shown in the bottom panel here. Um, so among e-cigarette users, 21% in our study began to smoke combustible cigarettes. However, once they begin to smoke cigarettes, the distribution of whether um, people are just experimenting, are infrequent users or are frequent users, looks almost identical between these two groups. Um, if you look at the pies, the pie graph on the right for each of these, um, you can see that there really isn't a lot of difference in, in what the frequency of cigarette smoking is after people begin to smoke cigarettes. So what this tells us really is that even though e-cigarette users are at a higher risk of beginning to smoke cigarettes, once they smoke cigarettes, they're on that cigarette smoking trajectory. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they got into cigarettes via e-cigarettes or without e-cigarettes as a precursor. Okay, so overall, e-cigarette users follow a similar trajectory as non-users into more frequent smoking. Um, and we know that greater frequency of vaping is associated with greater frequency of smoking and heaviness of smoking at follow-up. Um, and the second point from, from some other studies that I'm happy to talk more about uh, later. Okay, so now to sort of the real meat of this, like what can we do about this? Um, what do we need to know in order to put a stop to this trend of e-cigarettes bringing in new kids who then progress to cigarette smoking um, and, and follow the same trajectory onto um, more frequent cigarette smoking down the line? Um, so I think a first step is, is just really learning where youth are, pur are purchasing their e-cigarettes. So um, in this next study, um, this is from a new paper that we that is currently under review and has not been published yet. Um, we looked at the purchase locations of e-cigarettes and actually did this before the Tobacco 21 law was passed in California and after the Tobacco 21 law was passed. Um, and this is part of a paper that really was trying to understand whether uh, the T21 law had um, had any impact on where kids are getting their products. Uh, the main thing I think to take away from this is, you know, a lot of kids did not actually purchase products themselves. And this is, is mostly because they got them from, um, from their friends or colleagues or people at home. Or people at home. Um, but among those who did purchase products, the primary location where these underage kids have purchased tobacco products uh, have purchased their e-cigarettes is from a vape shop. Um, in a lot of local policy conversations, um, and and when I've gone to different you know board of supervisor meetings, and city council meetings, uh, a lot of a lot of discussion really is about whether um, you know retailers come in and say, look, nobody is purchasing tobacco products at vape shops. Um, you know, every all the kids are buying them over the internet. Um, but if you notice here, the, the proportion of kids who are buying tobacco products at vape shops, it, or buying e-cigarettes at vape shops, is substantially higher than those who are purchasing these products over the internet, um, which is a really important point to make at, um, at the local policy level. Okay, the other thing that is particularly concerning is that very few underage participants are being refused purchase of e-cigarettes. Um, so this graph really shows among those who were under the age of 21 or 21 or older um, after Tobacco 21 had come into, into play, this is about a year after, after the T21 law had been implemented in California, um, we asked kids like, when you've gone to purchase your e-cigarettes, has anyone refused to sell you e-cigarettes because of your age? 
among the 21 or older group, you can see that um, that 100% of them said no, um, which is fine. They're all legally able to purchase tobacco products, so that's what we would expect. But the thing that is really concerning is this under 21 group. So if you look here, 86% of, of people in our survey said that they were not refused purchase of e-cigarettes when they went to go buy e-cigarettes. 86%. So only 14% of people said that somebody refused to sell them a product because of their age. So um, this, I think, is, is really concerning and really the place where, um, where we can step in and, and really try and influence policy and, and make sure that there is sufficient enforcement so that this kind of thing is not happening. Um, when youth are trying to purchase e-cigarettes, we need 100% of those who are under the age of 21 to be, um, to, to report that, that, some, that they have not been able to successfully purchase tobacco products. Okay, so uh, this is another study um, on a related point that was uh, not published by our group, but was published by another, um, another group up in Northern California. Uh, and they were really interested in trying to understand what the, the official violation rates were for failing to check identification and for underage tobacco sailors sales by retailer type. Um, so this study was conducted in 2018. Um, and again, this was after the age of 21. They sent, um, after Tobacco 21 was passed. So they sent 18, 19, 20 year olds into stores, um, into all different kinds of stores to try and purchase tobacco products. So they, they had some um, kids who were purchasing uh, cigarettes and some were purchasing vape products um, and they went into a variety of different stores. So tobacco and vape shops, liquor stores, um, small markets and supermarkets, um, convenience stores and pharmacies. Um, overall. So uh, what this study did is they recorded, um, ooh, sorry, things are advancing more quickly than I wanted them to. Um, okay, so they went to check um, whether the, the proportion of youth who, who, when they went into the store, the retailer uh, failed to check identification and, and refused to sell them or, and did sell them uh, to a tobacco product, either cigarettes or, or vape products. Um, so among, overall, the place, the type of store that was the biggest violator um, that had the highest violation rates were, again, tobacco and vape shops. Um, in the tobacco and vape shops for e-cigarettes and vaping products in particular, 50%, um, 50% of the kids that went in here to, to purchase vape products, nobody checked their ID. Uh, it was a little bit lower for cigarettes, about 35% for cigarettes, but this is still shockingly high. Again, the, you know, this should be at zero. There should be no kids who are going into stores um, where they're not being asked for their ID at all. For underage tobacco sales, um, there was an even greater difference between tobacco, the sale of tobacco products and the sale of vape products. Um, so about 45% of underage kids who went in to purchase vape products were able to successfully do so. That is a shockingly high number, 45%. Um, for cigarettes, it was only about 22%, but again, this is still substantially higher than it should be. Um, when kids are going into stores, there really should be absolutely no way that they can purchase, uh, purchase tobacco products if they are not 21 or older or whatever the age of, of legal purchase of tobacco products is. So um, most underage youth are purchasing e-cigarettes at vape shops where they are largely not being refused purchase and where violation rates for not checking IDs and for selling to minors are very high. Um, this again, when we're considering local policy and how can we make local policy changes to reduce the burden of youth tobacco use, um, this is a really important point. Uh, you know, exempting vape shops from, um, from local policies that, that are aiming to try and reduce this, the sale of products to youth is, is really not a good mechanism. We really need to, to really target 
vape shops, which is where a lot of uh, a lot of this is happening, and where a lot of kids are getting access to uh, to e-cigarettes. Okay, so what is the impact of strong tobacco control policy? If we if we implement strong local policy, can we really make an in impact on youth tobacco um, youth tobacco use rates? So. Um, for this study, we use data from the American Lung Association State of Tobacco Control Grades. So the American Lung Association publishes, um, publishes these grades yearly. Uh, so they, they present for the entire U.S. Each state gets a grade um, based on how good their tobacco control is. Um, so they, the American Lung Association in, in 2019 had four different categories. So they get an overall grade, um, a grade for smoke-free outdoor air, um, a grade for smoke-free housing, and a grade for reducing sales of tobacco products to youth. So in this study, um, we, we used the data from the American Lung Association. Uh, we looked um, so in addition to providing state grades, they also provide grades for local jurisdictions that really, um, that really look at a number of different factors at the local political jurisdiction level. Um, because our study was spread across Southern California, we had some variability in, um, in the local tobacco control policies that, that um, are in place. So we look specifically at this um, at this category of reducing sales of tobacco products to minors. Um, and there's a, a number of different criteria that are used to assign the grade. Um, so first, uh, and this is kind of the most important point, uh, if communities, so in order to get a higher grade, uh, they needed to have an adequate annual retail license fee to cover the administration of an enforcement program and regular compliance checks in each store. So, an annual retail license fee of twenty dollars that you know or a, or a one-time tobacco retail license fee of twenty dollars is not going to cut it that's not a large enough fee in order to cover the administration of an enforcement program um, we found in our investigation that adequate annual retail licensing fees that can really cover sting operations and enforcement uh, were gen generally around three or four hundred dollars per year um, and that those fees get assessed every year. Um, the other thing is an annual renewal of this local license. So again, um, uh, communities got a higher grade if they didn't just have a one-time tobacco retail license fee, but if they had an annual renewal of the license. Um, the provision that any violation of local, state, or federal law is a violation of the license. Um, and a graduated penalty system for violators, including financial deterrence such as fines or other penalties, including license revocation or suspension. So basically, uh, in order to, to get a good grade in terms of how good the local policy is, um, we really needed to see that there was an adequate retail licensing fee to cover enforcement of the product that this of uh, to govern enforcement of uh, of the policy annual renewal um, that those who violate the, you know who who sell to minors who don't check licenses that there are penalties for them and that it's not just sort of a slap on the wrist that, that there actually is a penalty system that gets worse the more that you do it um, in our study, uh, really, I think the, the biggest thing, as I mentioned, is this adequate annual retail licensing fee. Um, so this is something that generally, uh, generally, if local jurisdictions had this policy in place, they tended to have the other three as well. Um, there were a, a handful of communities that, that had this without um, sort of meeting the remaining criteria. Because of this, our, our study really segregated into the communities that had really good tobacco control in meeting all of these criteria and thus receiving an A from the American Lung Association and communities that didn't have any of these criteria and thus received an F from the American Lung Association. So we were interested in looking to see whether the communities that had a grade of an A 
versus the communities that had a grade, grade of an F. Were there any differences in tobacco use rates among youth in those two communities? And what we found was that for cigarettes and e-cigarettes, the local tobacco control policy really did make a difference. Um, so among um, these, here are the odds ratios for, um, for youth living in jurisdictions that had strong enforcement versus those that had weak enforcement. Um, so what you can see here is that the odds of um, beginning to use cigarettes or uh, beginning to use cigarettes and using cigarettes in the past 30 days uh, are substantially lower for those who are living in communities that have really good enforcement. Um, this was particularly true for e-cigarettes where um, those who lived in jurisdictions that had um, that had a, a really strong tobacco control policy had about a 60% lower likelihood of beginning to, um, to use e-cigarettes and using e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. Um, so this, in, in my view, is really good evidence that um, these local policies really can impact youth use, youth use of e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely worth continuing to push forward on, um, on making sure that local policies have really good tobacco control measures in place and that there is, um, in addition to actually having tobacco retail licenses, uh, actually having a mechanism through which to enforce uh, compliance with, um, with reduce, in order to reduce sales of tobacco products to minors. So again, tobacco control policies that prioritize enforcement of restrictions of sales to minors can successfully reduce initiation of e-cigarette use among youth. Okay, so just to sort of wrap up everything that I um, have talked about over the last uh, half hour or so, um, e-cigarettes we know are drawing in new low-risk youth. The youth who begin using e-cigarettes are more likely to subsequently try combustible cigarettes, and this risk is greater for those who are at low risk of beginning to smoke. Um, youth who vape follow a similar trajectory into more regular smoking as those who start with cigarettes. Um, youth are easily able to purchase e-cigarettes and do so primarily from vape shops where the violation rates are very, very high. Um, and finally, strong tobacco control policy really can reduce youth initiation and use of e-cigarettes and of cigarettes as well. Hey, so I'd like to just acknowledge my USC collaborators and the many students and trainees that I work with who do uh, a lot of this excellent work as well as a lot of the outside collaborators that I work with um, as we as we move to try and again reduce the public health impact of e-cigarettes and other tobacco product use among you. So at this time um, I will uh, take some questions from um, from CADCA and from the audience. Hello everyone. Uh, first for this question and answer session, Katka is going to ask Dr. Barrington Trimis a few questions and then it's we're going to turn it over to you to also ask your own questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Barrington Trimis about her research, please go ahead and uh, type it in the question and answer box. Um, I guess you can also put it in the chat box, but I think it'd be easier if you put them all in the question and answer box. Um, so the first question is, uh, you mentioned that e-cigarettes are drawing in low-risk use. Why do you think that is? And I guess, what can we do about it? Yes, so, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the things that really, uh, so, so in California, we've done a really, really great job of stigmatizing um, combustible cigarette use and denormalizing combustible cigarette use. Um, so, you know, you, when you walk down the street here, uh, nobody, nobody is smoking cigarettes. And if you see somebody smoking cigarettes, uh, kids today will, you know, will, will turn up their nose and, um, you know, it's really looked down upon. Cigarettes, cigarette smoking is seen not as something that's cool or, or something that anybody really wants to do. Um, on the other hand, e-cigarettes are, are cool. They're the, the cool thing to do. So, there's a lot of different things that contribute to that. One, 
um, is the availability of e-cigarettes and a lot of flavors that are appealing to you. Um, you can buy e-cigarettes in any flavor that you are interested in. Um, you can buy bubble gum and cotton candy and chocolate uh, tiramisu and just any kind of e-cigarette flavor you're interested in is available. Um, I think at last count there were maybe more than 15,000 different, different flavors that are available on the market. Um, so flavors no doubt play a role in this. With cigarettes, you just get cigarette flavor at, or menthol. Um, but with e-cigarettes, you get all kinds of different flavors. Um, the other thing is this, you know, this sort of culture around e-cigarette use. So as vape shops have continued to pop up all over the place, um, there's really this, this new culture of vaping that has emerged, emerged over the last you know, decade or so. Um, so these, the vape shops are, are kind of seen as hangout places where people go and, and can congregate and um, hang out with other people who are vapors and they're, you know, the insides of vape shops um, oftentimes are, you know, they're completely unlike regular tobacco shops where people just sort of go in and buy their cigarettes and leave. Like vape shops, people go to hang out and talk with with others and it's you know the, the inside of these shops is, tends to be clean and and just really appealing to people um, so I think kind of the combination of all of these things um, you know and with the devices you can personalize them you can make them your own um, even with jewel that comes in in sort of one option you can get skins um, that are that are sort of akin to cell phone cases to personalize it um, so there's just a lot you can do with e-cigarettes that I think has kind of contributed overall um, to bringing in kids that are, um, that, that otherwise never would have smoked. Um, one last thing, and I'm sorry, I've been rambling a little bit on this question, um, you know, is I think the perception early on that e-cigarettes were, uh, were not harmful. Um, and we know now um, from, from our research that that's not necessarily the case. And certainly there's been a lot of reports um, in the news media recently about kids that have been um, having some struggles with respiratory problems. Um, but I think early on, e-cigarettes were very much promoted as a safe product that just emitted water vapor um, that I think was, was responsible for bringing in a lot of low risk youth who knew cigarettes were bad and didn't want to smoke cigarettes. Thanks. Uh, so our next question, you talked a little bit about how vape shops are more of an attractive place to hang out. So how can local activists work with vape shops to curb underage e-cigarette sales and also kind of make them not be the cool place to be? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, this is, this is a challenging question. And I think um, this sort of goes along with uh, question number three as well. So I'll sort of give an answer combined uh, uh, for both of those questions combined. Um, you know, I think the key is really this local policy enforcement that we talked about. Um, one, uh, one thing that has been gaining some traction here in California is the restriction of, uh, of sales of e-cigarettes in flavors other than tobacco. So I'm sure folks are aware that in Northern California, there have been, um, particularly in San Francisco, there have been a lot of policies that, um, that have been proposed um, and, and voted in that, that completely restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products. Um, there's a lot of evidence that has been published recently that those who are using e-cigarettes um, may not use e-cigarettes if they were not available in uh, in all of these really fun and exciting flavors. So that's one thing that I think has been happening a lot around um, in California and in other places across the country as well. Um, one thing that I think is really important when, um, when moving these, these flavor prohibitions forward is that there seems to be a trend towards some um, some places, some jurisdictions, uh, allowing flavors in locations that are restricted to those who are 21 or older, like vape shops, for example. However, based on the data that I've shown here and, and other data, uh, you know, I don't think this is a good strategy. I think we need to restrict the flavor of, uh, of 
sorry, that restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, including menthol cigarettes, from all locations, not just from places where kids can go. Because we know that kids are going into vape shops, even though they're 21 or older, um, in theory, and, uh, and are purchasing, primarily purchasing their products from those locations. All right, so you said you answered two and three, so I'm just gonna move on to four. Uh, where can interested participants find more information about your research? And are there any other resources that you can recommend for coalitions that are working on tobacco retail licensing policy to address youth vaping in their communities? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, in terms of where there's more information about our research, um, that we, we have our publications uh, posted on um, our website and I can share that information with, uh, with folks. Um, and I'm also happy to, if, if anyone has questions, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to, to share and talk uh, with, with people about what we are up to and the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, you know, I think for coalitions that are working on tobacco retail licensing policy, I think a really um, a really useful thing is to is to touch base with uh, local jurisdictions that have been successful in um, in getting tobacco like local tobacco retail licenses um, to be passed. So I you know I think. Um, the strategy that a lot of coalition members in in Southern California have taken, and actually all throughout California, um, and and again, this is just the the people that I'm sort of most familiar with in terms of the the political work that's being done here, um, has largely been like let's use what other what has been successful in other local jurisdictions and apply those exact same strategies to um, to whatever new community that we're going to. Um, uh, to try and pass new new policies. So, and I think you know it's really important to, um, if at all possible, to engage researchers to to have researchers come to city council meetings and board of supervisor meetings and talk with policymakers um, to really convey the research um, because I think a lot of times. Um, policymakers just are they don't have you know they they are doing a million different things and and don't necessarily have all of the information on what's happening particularly around youth tobacco product use thanks i think we're ready now to take start taking questions from participants so i'm going to turn it over to maria to ask start asking those questions and everybody on the line if you have questions there's still time go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Great, thank you, Carolina. And I wanna do a quick sound check again. Can everyone hear me okay? I'll wait for a yes in the comment box. Wonderful, thank you. So we got several questions that relate to schools. So I'm gonna to try to summarize those into one question here and ask, what are the best strategies that schools can employ to combat the epidemic within school walls? That's a great question and a tough one. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, um, I'm not sure. I think that a couple of things are really important. One, um, schools definitely, so, so I think we need at, at a minimum education, right? So teachers often don't, like don't know what vape pens look like. I mean, I think everybody more or less probably knows what a jewel looks like, but because the products keep evolving and keep changing, um, I think there needs to be continued education with, um, with teachers and principals and school officials and um, security guards and, and sort of everybody that is working in the school setting um, to just keep everybody up to date on what what to look for. Um, increasingly, this, this idea of stealth vaping or, or vaping products that are meant to be hidden from people um, seem to be popping up more and more. Um, I know that a, a bunch of schools have already started to, um, to take measures to prevent youth from jeweling in bathrooms, which has been a huge problem sort of across the board. Um, one of the schools locally interest, um, included a new uh, a new 
vaping detector that was developed, uh, which they installed in bathrooms and, and said that they've gotten some initial, um, initial response. So, uh, yeah, d does that, are you, is everyone able to hear me okay with they see a comment that the sound is a little spotty. I'm able to hear you fine. So maybe it's just unfortunately that location. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted to double check and make sure that it wasn't um, sort of an across the board problem. Thank you. Here's another question that relates more to creating a local tobacco licensing fee. Do you have other ideas regarding the best use for the funds collected through the licensing fee in addition to an enforcement and administration program? And which county or city agency is actually responsible for vape and smoke shop enforcement? And lastly, do you know of any communities or cities that would be a role model in this area? Yeah, so, um, so that's a that's a great series of questions. Um, so I think, you know, the probably, so in terms of, let me start with the last one first. So in terms of, of role models, I think a lot of, um, there, there's a great group here in, uh, in, in California that has done a lot of work um, in San Francisco and has moved to other types of, uh, and other locations in, in, throughout the state that have been really successful in implementing strong tobacco control policy. Um, I'm happy to put folks in touch with that group because um, I think they can talk, um, I, I've, they've been way more involved in what's happening at the local level in terms of actually making, um, pushing policy forward and, and have been quite successful in getting policies passed. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to share that, their contact information and, and folks can touch base with them. So, and can, can you remind me what the other two questions are? Because I. Yes, thank you. I think you, you did sum it up pretty well, but okay. if there are any great champion communities or cities that would be examples to look by. Yeah, so, so I'll, um, I'll get contact information for the best people to talk to about that specifically. Wonderful, thank you. Another different area of the questions here is about quitting vaping. Um, so can you talk at all about any research you know about quitting vaping and do you intend to study what works with youth who are trying to quit vaping? Yeah, so um, you know, there's so far there's not been a lot of data on quitting vaping. I think that up until the last maybe year or so, this idea that youth needed to quit vaping was um, was not really something that was at the forefront of people's minds, right? We, everybody was worried about the fact that people were, that kids were going from vaping to smoking. I think with, you know, with the rising popularity of Juul and other salt-based um, products, there's increasingly this concern of, of kids being addicted to their vaping products uh, and having a hard time. Um, right now, I'm not aware of any research that is going on to address this, um, although we, uh, we have a couple of different product, projects going on um, where we, we are trying to get information. So we have one study where we're looking at, um, at what folks are posting on Twitter to see, uh, just to see what people are talking about in terms of quitting vaping um, or quitting use of Juul. Um, but I, you know, this is definitely something that uh, is increasingly getting a lot of attention. The FDA recently had um, had a whole uh, day workshop on strategies to help youth and young adults quit vaping, uh, which I believe is published uh, publicly available if anyone wants to watch the uh, that session. Great, thank you. Another question here, how can the standardized tobacco assessment for retail settings or STARS assessment be used to help contribute to retail and licensing? That is a great question. And unfortunately, I don't know much about the STARS program. Um, so I don't have much of an answer for that question. I'm sorry. That is okay. And we will send out a resource related to that um, with everything else after this webinar. 
So next question I'm going to do is combine um, several questions that take on the theme of additives into these substances. So one question was how much of the availability of THC containing juice is part of youth interest in starting to vape? And then another similar question is what about research done on aromatherapy pens like MONQ um, promoting healthy oil vaping? Um, are you familiar with any research that's coming out on, on these additives? Yeah, so um, so starting with the aromatherapy, I have heard about these aromatherapy pens, but I, I haven't seen any research on them yet. Um, so I don't know, I don't really have any idea of how commonly used these products are or um, or sort of even what's in them or what the adverse health effects are. And I don't think that there's been much research here in, in that regard in particular. Um, with respect to the THC and cannabis vaping. Um, so far in our research, we have found that uh, vaping nicotine is way more common than vaping cannabis, although cannabis use overall is, is generally far more prevalent than nicotine use. So I'm just, I know it's a little bit of a, uh, let me rephrase. So kids are using cannabis. The rates of cannabis use are very high in, in our populations in Southern California. And I think across the country, especially with legalization and decriminalization of cannabis use. Um, however, within the realm of cannabis use, most youth are still primarily using combustible cannabis products. Um, and the proportion that are using vaping products is, is still relatively small. So we're continuing to do research in this field and we'll be keeping track of, of what's happening. Um, and there's the monitoring the future studies is also um, keeping track of, of what's happening and tracking this over time among youth. Great, thank you. We're gonna take one or two more questions depending on time. Um, this one is, from someone who's in a small city within a city of just three square miles. And they have their own leadership, departments of health, police, fire, et cetera. And one of the questions that they're getting often is, how will we, such a small city that's already so low staffed, um, for example, two people at the health department, how will we be able to manage this enforcement? It's unlikely we're gonna hire another person, but will the financial return of the tobacco retail license actually be enough to support the program's compliance checks? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think that's the um, that's where you can really make an argument that the licensing fees need to be large enough in order to cover that. Um, so I think depending on how many tobacco retailers and, and both of, of um, vaping products and, and of traditional tobacco retailers are in that city, I think that w really will have an impact on um, on, on how the feasibility of getting this done and whether this becomes something that that you know is is something that's taken on by the existing folks in in um, which seems like maybe is not is like a non-starter um, but I think you know if there's if there are enough retailers and the licensing fees are large enough then that the idea is that the fees be large enough in order to support somebody to administer and to conduct all of the compliance checks. Great. Thank you, Dr. Barrington Tremis. And I'm going to pass this on now to Carolina to close this out. I actually have uh, one more question for Dr. Barrington Tremis. Uh, someone asked uh, when the studies you mentioned that are under review currently are going to be published. If you can give an approximate date, uh, that'd be helpful. She was really interested in the one regarding the purchase locations uh, for e-cigarettes among youth. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, I myself would also like to know the answer to that. Um, you know, it's th these uh, that paper in particular is is currently under review. If everything goes well and it uh, you know and it gets accepted at the, the first place that we've submitted it to, then it's possible the paper um, should be out within the next like uh, maybe three or four months. Um, but it, really the review process for papers takes, you know, can really can take a long time or it can be really quick. And it's, it's uh, unfortunately don't have a lot of information on, on when that'll, that will come out. Okay. 
thanks for giving it your best shot. Um, <laughs> I hope it comes out sooner rather than later. I hope so too. I hope so too. Um, before we wrap things up, I want to let everyone know about two upcoming webinars we have in this series. Uh, I'm going to send out more information about these webinars in the coming months, but I just wanted to give you a sneak preview, if you will. So first, we're having a special edition on September 27th, and we're partnering with GIA for that um, special edition. The Center for Public Interest Communications at the University of Florida will present their research on the topic, The Science of What Makes People Care. Uh, this is going to be a great webinar for those of you who want your public health communications to be more effective. And we also have a webinar coming up on October 23rd in which Dr. Robert DuPont and Dr. Caroline DuPont will present the findings from their article, Drug Use Among Youth, National Survey Data Support Common Liability of All Drug Use. And that article discusses how youth marijuana use, cigarette use, or alcohol use is associated with other substance use. Um, and a couple quick notes before we close out. If you would like a letter of participation for this webinar for continuing education or your work just wants to see what you're doing, uh, please send an email to me at kduth at cadca.org. Um, I put that in the chat box earlier, but I will go ahead and uh, put that in again right now. Um, so if you need that letter, please email me at the email that's in the chat box. Um, as mentioned earlier, I will distribute the slides following this webinar to everyone who participated. And I'm also going to post the recording of the webinar and a couple of resources that were mentioned in the question and answer session on the CADCA website in the next week or so. And once I do that, I'll email out the link to participants. Uh, thank you to Dr. Barrington Trimis for the wonderful presentation on your research and for your tireless work providing relevant and current research. And thanks also to CounterTools for their partnership in producing this webinar. And finally, thank you to the webinar participants for your comments, questions, and insights.